Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this next session. I hope you're having a fantastic time at the conference. Um, my name is Susanna Clark, and I'm the VP of Comms for Farfetch, and I have the great pleasure of moderating this panel that we've called Fashion, Tech, and the Power of Yes. Um, I'm actually going to ask each of our uh, uh, panelists to actually introduce themselves before we kick off into some questions. And after about 15 minutes of hearing from us, we're going to turn um, questions over to you guys so you can ask anything you'd like as well. But really excited to be here. And I would love, if you don't mind, to hand over to Alexis Williams, who is from The Guardian. Over to you, Alexis. Thanks, Susanna. So uh, my name's Alexis Williams. I'm currently the fashion publisher at The Guardian. Um, which incorporates The Guardian and The Observer newspapers, but also TheGuardian.com. Amazing. And over to you, please, Vanessa. Hi, I'm Vanessa Spence. So I'm Design Director at ASOS.com. So I'm responsible for all of the menswear and women's wear products. Fantastic. And finally, Sean, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Sean Keane and I'm the Chief People Officer at Farfetch. So I'm responsible for all things people and culture at Farfetch. Amazing. So when the four of us got together first, we were talking a little bit about each other's careers and how we wound up um, on a panel like this this afternoon. And I was hoping I could hear from Alexis first and then all of you actually about how you ended up in a world of both fashion and tech um, and really where you thought you'd be at this part of your career and if anything changed along the way. Thanks, Susanna. So um, it's a real mystery to me how I ended up in fashion and tech, although I'm super happy I did. Um, I absolutely love fashion, which is a really important part of culture. Um, but, you know, at university, um, Susanna, I was studying economics and politics. And back then, you know, all I really wanted to do was what my peers wanted to do, um, was to get a fabulous job at a great organisation like Goldman Sachs, earn lots of money, become very rich and powerful, and then die. <laughs> Um, and so um, when you do the kind of the, the milk round, all the interviews um, for graduate jobs, um, a role at the FT came up, the Financial Times, um, which was um, selling advertising. So that wasn't so interesting, but what was interesting is the brand. And uh, a very long story short, um, I secured a job at the Financial Times. I thought I'd do that for a year and then move on to an investment bank. Um, but over time, I just grew my um, career within media, started working with the fashion team and the how to spend it team um, at the Financial Times. And then ultimately, The Guardian approached me a few years ago and asked me to publish um, their fashion magazine. So that's how I end up where I am, which is a complete accident and a fluke. Amazing. And Sean, over to you. Uh, are you with us at Farfetch by sheer accident and fluke? Um, well, slightly. Um, I have what I call quite a squiggly career path. So I studied human sciences in university and worked developing behavioral programs um, straight out of university, then um, slightly randomly moved into recruitment. So it took a bit of a bit of a turn. Uh, then had a family with two children and felt probably a little bit lost actually with what I wanted to do with my career. Um, I met an amazing coach. So my um, career journey into what I love doing happened quite later in life uh, when it helped me to figure out and my love for fashion and technology and hence my move into Farfetch. Amazing. And Vanessa, um, I believe you're probably one of the longest standing members on our panel um, in your current role. Tell us a little bit about your journey to ASOS and, and uh, while you've been there. Yeah, so I've been at ASOS for 13 years. So um, I think like when I first started ASOS, I was the third designer to start there. Um, I've now got a team of um, nearly 100 people. So like massive, massive change. Um, like I had quite a traditional sort of start to it. I studied fashion at uni. I think if you'd asked me when I was five what I wanted to do, I would have said I wanted to be a fashion designer, definitely. 
but I definitely wouldn't have, if you'd asked me probably 10 years ago if I wanted to be in management, if I wanted to be a design director, I would have said no. I was very much all about hands-on, creative, but as I kind of moved into along in my career, I just saw the benefits of being able to kind of work and nurture people, develop them, and actually to be able to direct them and then create something even more amazing than I could ever kind of even imagined. So, yeah, it's evolved. Amazing. And I think one of the things um, that has been really interesting to me in speaking to all of you and just hearing those stories right now is it, there seems to be kind of a common theme for all of you, which is a path wasn't particularly smooth or clear, but you said yes to things. And I'd be really interested to understand, perhaps starting with Sean, how do you know when these moments were the right opportunity to actually say yes and go in a different direction? Because that must have been quite scary, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I when I moved from a career of 15 years in recruitment to thinking about setting up my own um, startup business in human resources for very small companies, that was that was the move that um, I think at the time took a lot of a lot of bravery. Um, but what was um, very clear to me after having the coaching that I just described was that I really wanted to do something that I loved. And the biggest lesson that I've learned in my career is think less about how you can fit into a box in a company and think more about what sort of work do you love doing. Because once you find something and say yes to something that you love doing, it feels really natural. It doesn't feel like work. You're enjoying it. It's got meaning and purpose. Um, and it's incredibly rewarding. So um, that was a big leap of faith for me is, is thinking less about seniority and title and much more about, um, you know, what sort of work will I love doing? Would I love to do? Amazing. And Alexis, was that similar to your experience? Did you have your know, natural moments where you thought it was easy to say yes to something that felt a little out of your comfort zone? Or was it harder, harder for you to find those moments? Um, I think looking back retrospectively, it does seem that I've found the opportune moments to say yes to things. But at the time, um, so the, the, the biggest um, example I can give you is leaving the FT and moving to the Guardian. Um, and so at that moment in time, I was very comfortable in what I was doing. I was working at one of the best magazines in the world, How to Spend It, the forefront of fashion and also luxury um, for a very well respected publication. Um, I was in a groove, I was in a niche, I made my, a name for myself. And The Guardian approached me and that, that actually panicked me. Um, but I realized at that moment in time that I was too young to have been at a company for you know, um, 12 years. I was only um, you know, about 36, 37 at the time. Um, so I, it was a panic, but I said yes, because I felt like I needed to do it. But looking back on it, it was absolutely the right time. And I think sometimes, you know, yes, I believe in the universe, and, but I think sometimes things come to you unexpectedly and you should grab those opportunities. Amazing. And Vanessa, tell me, has it been the same for you where obviously it might not have been as easy to, to spot these moments of change when you're at the same organisation or is that actually completely wrong and you were able to spot the moments to say yes? Yeah, I think for me, like, I think one of my biggest moments in terms of having to say, saying yes to something was definitely joining ASAR. So at that point, I'd been in fashion for, I don't know, probably coming up to sort of 10, 10 years. And ASOS was like one of the first sort of online um, fashion, like, you know, e-tailers. Um, and, you know, at that point, really like 13 years ago, selling fashion online to females in particular was something that was kind of being said couldn't be done. And, you know, when they first approached me for the role, I was like, to be honest, I didn't even know what as seen on screen was at that point, um, because it just wasn't something in terms of that sort of high street bricks and mortar space that we even really looked at and so to say yes to that at that point took a lot of bravery and sort of going to sort of Sean's point in terms of that really thinking about what your values are and that's 
what made me say yes to ASOS is that I felt that as a company, they were aligned to my values and I could really see myself working there and being really being able to like develop and grow. And I mean, when I, when I said yes, like all of my kind of friends and my work colleagues that were really experienced, they, just, they were like, what are you doing? Like, you, you're not going to have a job in three months. Like, why are you doing that? And it was weird because I couldn't even really tangibly explain why it was just about a feeling and like like I say it kind of worked with my values amazing and I think um that brings us actually to a really interesting point which is it all sounds great now everyone's where they are in their career and they said yes at the right times and they got there um I think it can sometimes be hard um when you are hearing other people talk about their careers to know where to start. If you've got something that you really feel very strongly and passionately about, what are the things that you can actually do, particularly in an environment like we're in at the moment where it might not be that easy just to jump careers at the moment? What are the things that people could potentially do um, in order to explore those passions and where do you start? Um, maybe, Sean, you could start with that question. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I and think Speaking from experience, when I was working in recruitment, I never worked in technology and I'd never worked in fashion, but I knew I loved both. Um, and so I can tell you a little bit about what I did and hopefully that will resonate a little bit with, you know, providing some inspiration if somebody's thinking about changing or starting a, a career. So the first thing I did was um, I knew I wanted to work with people um, and I knew then therefore I needed to get the right qualification. So I studied my CIPD, which is the HR qualification at night, and in order to really get that under under my belt. Um, the next thing I did was, um, and I haven't talked about this time, but I went down the list of all the people who work in fashion magazines at the time and started to reach out to see what connections I have, because everyone's connected to somebody on LinkedIn, for example. Um, and there were a few people that I knew that knew someone or was related to someone or married to someone in another um, business. And, um, I, and, I, and I started, you know, reaching out and, and making some connections. And then one thing led to another. Um, and along came a very small company called Farfetch that was 20 people at the time that was wanting some <laughs> HR support. And then that was what I said yes to. So I think it's thinking about all the feelers around the industry that you're interested in and trying to make connections wherever possible. Amazing. Vanessa, do you have anything to add to that as well? No, do you know what I say? Like the same as Sean, it is about like just connecting and trying to make those contacts. I think really try to sort of research and understand the field as well. And I'd say like, just don't be too rigid. So I think, you know, be willing, if something else comes up, be willing to pivot, be willing to, you know, as you go along the journey, there might be something else that actually you find that you think you'd love even more. Amazing. And Alexis, I imagine you know, uh, your career has been a bit of pivoting too. How have you been able to follow what you're passionate about? So the career, my career has been a constant pivot, mainly because newspapers have kind of like ballooned from being just a print publication into being a digital global media sort of situation. And so, um, I mean, this is a bit of a love fest because I'm going to mirror exactly what Sean and Vanessa are saying. But, you know, the, so what I did personally, actually, is to... Um, my background is print advertising and the buzzword about 10 or 15 years ago was about digital everything. So I had my job, but on the side and um, with different departments, I aligned myself with what they were doing. I went to all of their training courses. I made myself indispensable to them. I volunteered my time. I went out of my way um, to find out what was happening in that tech space, what was happening with digital. And before before I actually knew that this is the role I wanted to do in tech and fashion, um, I was already doing it. So I think the advice really is to, you know, even if it's for a charity, like, you know, just go out and volunteer a bit of your time to gain that experience. Amazing. And I think, you know, one of the things thinking about this audience who are all in tech, and I've personally been in tech in some uh, shape or form for 20 years, I'm really interested to understand from each of you why, um, fashion or even publishing, which are potentially traditional um, industries that haven't embraced tech to the same degree as other industries have. Why does fashion need tech? Sean, I'm going to start with you. Yes, well, um, speaking from the experience of Farfetch, it, it's very much around the connections. So 
for the wonderful um, traditional history of the fashion industry, the most important thing that technology can offer is making the connection between all the creators, the curators, and the customers of fashion. So it's a real enabler and provides the online experience for all three um, and, and really makes that connection point. So I think that the, the power of the technology in enabling um, us to be able to do that on a global basis is, is really incredible. Amazing. And Vanessa, obviously ASOS has been digital rather like Farfetch from day one. Uh, kind of what's your point of view on that as a designer? Yeah, so like like you say, yeah, we're completely like text embedded in everything we do. But I'd say definitely from a design point of view, it's really evolved. Like at you know, 13 years ago at the beginning, um, you know, we didn't have as many tech resources just in terms of like how we research, how we get our information, and everything's so accessible now and it's really global. And I think like personally, like in terms of fashion, that's made fashion more interesting and made it maybe like just more more attainable and less elitist and I think like anything that does that I think is a real positive. Amazing and then Alexis any um, extra to add there from a publishing point of view? Yeah, so I mean one of the um, there are lots of opportunities in, in tech fashion publishing mainly because you know the fashion magazine which is print it's tactile it's beautiful it engages people and it has done for centuries um, one of the limitations we find is how do we take that experience to a digital space like that really interesting very kind of um, sybaritic point of view um, that is tactile how do you make that digital and how do you use tech to drive that so we have the data we know what people like but it's how do we manifest itself what does it look like and how can we get that onto mobile devices for example so that's the that that is the big challenge actually publishing still faces and it's particularly important for fashion and culture it's very exciting okay i'm going to actually take time now if that's all right with everyone here to move on to some q a so please definitely ask questions we've got about five minutes to do that we have a couple so far so i was wondering actually sean if you wouldn't mind um answering this question which is how would you conquer fear or imposter syndrome when trying to move jobs oh yes i can speak firsthand about that <laughs> um so um <laughs> I think one of the one of the best things to do is to realize it's there. It's real. I mean, I think everyone has imposter syndrome, whether they um, admit it or not. Um, I certainly have it. I still have it every day, even here now today. I have it. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I talk about is to realize the uniqueness of what you have to offer. So everyone's life experiences, their the background that they came from, the education you've had, the socializing that you've had is different to somebody else's. And then therefore, everyone has a perspective to offer in any form of discussion. So what I would say is think less about whether or not you feel you should be there or not and think more about what is your perspective and please voice and speak up and, and give that perspective because it will be absolutely unique to anybody else in the room. I think that's really great advice. Would either of our other panellists like to um, comment on that particular question too? Um, I, I would just like to say um, thank you, Sean, because I'm actually going to take that advice on board. Um, it's something I also suffer with every single day. Um, you know, the one thing I do do, though, is to um, enjoy it. Um, like, you know, enjoy that imposter syndrome, enjoy the fact that you've been given an opportunity um, to show your uniqueness. And that's that's how I've dealt with it for now. But I think Sean's advice is, is perfect. And I'll, I'll report back to you, Sean. I'll let you know how I get on. <laughs> Vanessa, let me know if you've got anything else to add or we'll kick into some other questions. Yeah, no, just to echo, I think like I think people forget and they think that other people don't have suffered from it. I think everyone does. I I you know, I think, you know, your biggest CEO will have it. And I think it's just remembering that, you know, just remember who you are and what you have to offer and, and that you you're not on your own. Everyone experiences it. Amazing. I'm going to go into a couple of similar questions before I go back to one about the Fashion Minority Alliance, if that's okay with everyone. What is What are the most important qualities about getting into fashion tech coming from a traditional fashion background? Perhaps, Sean, do you want to talk about that one? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, we, uh, speaking specifically again about Farfetch, we recruit people from both fashion and technology backgrounds. And I think the, the biggest thing to remember there is similar to what I explained is that you, you've, you have a uniqueness and something to offer. Um, and it, it's not so much about, um, oh, I tick this box on fashion, but I don't tick this box on um technology and more aligned to what Vanessa was talking about, which is thinking I have this to offer for my experience in fashion or technology. And actually I'm aligned to the values of the company. And if you blend those things together, the other parts can be learned. Um, so it's thinking about what is unique from a, from a purpose and values point of view combined with your experience. Amazing. And then we have a question here about the Fashion Minority Alliance. And if anyone could tell us a little bit more about that, which of our panelists would like to take that on? And have you guys got that information? So I think really what we're trying to do with the Fashion Minority Alliance is to open up opportunities for, um, you know, minority groups in the fashion space. Um, and, you know, because it is a traditional industry, um, it has, you know, fashion does have kind of, let's say, traditional challenges to overcome. And so I think what we're trying to do as an organisation is to facilitate that conversation and to connect organisations with the opportunities out there. Because, you know, as Sean is saying, we all have unique experiences which add to this richness that is fashion and, and fashion as a part of contemporary culture um, is a sum of all of our parts so um, we're, we're helping to facilitate that conversation and um, make the fashion industry more rich and diverse and interesting and engaging. That's fantastic. And really sadly, we have run out of time, but I'm absolutely certain all of our panelists would not mind if you reached out to them on LinkedIn, given we've all given advice to network and find out who you know. Um, and we really hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you very much to all of our panelists and to everyone for listening in.